As I look around, uh, virtually all of you have been important to me at one time or another. And so thank you for being here. One housekeeping chore. If you see me sitting down periodically, it's because if I stand too long in one place, I get sciatica and then I fall over. And that wouldn't be good. Fortunately, it doesn't bother me on the bicycle or backpacking. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about two things that are very important to me, backpacking and the John Muir Trail. Backpacking is when you take a backpack, you fill it up with everything you're going to need for two or three days, such as uh, a tent, I think I'm losing this, a, a tent, um, a sleeping bag, etc. And you go hiking out into the wilderness. And uh, the nice thing about that is you end up in places where you can't uh, drive to. So you have the wilderness to yourself. I first started backpacking in 1988. Uh, some of you may remember Dave Williams. He and Corrine Farm, south of uh, Villisca. And he was my mentor. And uh, Michael Thompson, my friend, uh, also joined us. And the three of us backpacked together for 20 years. Um, Dave took us first to Rocky Mountain National Park. Uh, and then he took us to the top of Mount Rainier one year, and a year or two later to the bottom of the Grand Canyon, to Zion, or Cascades, uh, all over. Uh, but throughout that time, uh, the thing that went through my mind is someday I want to hike the John Muir Trail. I'd heard about it. I didn't know much about it, but at the back of my mind, I always wanted to do it. 30 years later, I finally got the chance. The John Muir Trail is a through hike. It lasts 212 miles. It extends from Yosemite National Park, which is about 100 miles east of San Francisco. It extends from there down to uh, the top of Mount Whitney. Uh, a through hike is where you start one place and you end up in another place. The most uh, famous through hike is the Appalachian Trail. Uh, it's 2,200 miles long. It goes from Georgia to Maine. Uh, the second most popular uh, through hike is the Pacific Crest Trail. It's 2,600 miles long. It starts uh, at the Mexico-California border and goes up to the Washington-Canada border. So the John Muir Trail at only 212 miles is minimal compared to that. <laughs> but there are some drawbacks to a long through hike. Um, if you're going to do the whole thing on the Appalachian Trail, you have to start in March and you get done in October or so. The same with the Pacific Crest Trail. Most people can't spend six months uh, hiking. Um, the other drawback to the Appalachian Trail is it goes through civilization most of the time. Uh, and so you're really not getting away from people. The John Muir Trail is... Um, arguably the most uh, scenic trail, hiking trail in the country. It runs along the spine of the Sierra Nevada mountains. With the Appalachian Trail, you're probably familiar with it because Bill Bryson did a walk in the woods. Maybe you've read that. Um, and the Pacific Press Trail, you may have read Wild. Cheryl Strayed um, wrote about that. Let's talk about John Muir for a minute. Who was John Muir? He was born in 1838 in Dunbar, Scotland. When he was 11, his family immigrated to the United States and they settled on a little farm near Portage, Wisconsin, which is about 50 miles north of Madison. John Muir was the son of a very uh, strict Calvinist person. He had a difficult childhood. He went to school at the University of Wisconsin. He was good at inventing things, but he wasn't really sure what he wanted to do. <clears throat> By the age of 29, he was in Indianapolis uh, working for a wagon wheel company. And while working there, uh, a tool pierced his right eye and he was temporarily blinded. When he finally got his sight back, he decided he was gonna, well, he'd already lost that job. He decided he'd walk a thousand miles down to Florida. This is in the mid 1800s. He got to Florida and he caught malaria. He was deathly ill for about three months. Uh, he then uh, booked a passage around through the Panama Canal and went to San Francisco. 
And at that point, he heard about the wonders of the Sierra Nevada mountains. He was still searching for what it was that his life was all about. He hiked across the, the valley and, and came to what is now the uh, Yosemite National Park. He hired on as a sheep herder. And there in Yosemite, he suddenly realized what his life is all about. Uh, it all became clear. He was actually a naturalist. And not just any naturalist, he had the gift of being able to craft words into wonderful books, wonderful articles. And his words created excitement in almost everyone who read them. And therefore, people throughout the United States started paying attention to nature. Some of the, some of the statements he made that are, I think, famous, climb the mountains and get their good tidings. Nature's peace will flow into you as sunshine flows into trees. The winds will blow their own freshness into you and the storms their energy, while cares fall off like autumn leaves. I only went out for a walk and then finally decided to stay out till, sun, till sunset because going out, I discovered, was really going in. Who wouldn't be a mountaineer? Up here, all the world's prizes seem nothing. And then the one that I use on my wife every year or two, the mountains are calling and I must go. <laughs> so she bought me the shirt. <laughs> there are many, many, many wonderful statements that Muir made. In fact, there's a book of them right here. 100 pages, wonderful statements. Uh, some of you may remember the severe ice storm that hit Florinda in the winter of 91 or 92. It was a Saturday night. I was on call. And in the middle of the night, the emergency room kept calling. And as Henry, my dog, and I kept walking back and forth to the hospital, we could hear throughout the town big limbs cracking and crashing to the ground. And uh, by morning, it was obvious that uh, it was a disaster. Clorinda didn't look nearly the same. And I was feeling crestfallen. And this is a true story. I suddenly said to myself, John Muir will tell me something. And I'd hardly flipped a page or two, and there it was, earth has no sorrow that earth cannot heal. Earth has no sorrow that earth cannot heal. And suddenly I felt so much better. And if you remember, within four or five years, Clorinda the normal again. Where the limbs had fallen, sunlight flooded in, and the trees put forth new branches, new leaves, and earth was able to heal itself. Earth, uh, nature's timeline isn't our timeline. Often it takes much longer than that, but Earth does heal. If you're thinking that you'd like to read a John Muir book, I would suggest that you start with my first summer in the Sierras. Remember I said he, he was 30 years old or so by now. Uh, he didn't know what he wanted to do. He arrived at the Sierras and suddenly he knew and that exuberance shows up in this book. One of my favorite passages is on July 8th. And he's so excited to be out in there and he's regretting, why does somebody have to sleep? I want to be seeing things all the time. And so he writes, it seems extravagant to spend hours in precious sleep. Oh, the pity of it, to sleep in the midst of eternal beautiful motion instead of gazing forever like the stars. But the next morning, exhilarated with the mountain air, I feel like shouting this morning with an excess of wild animal joy. So it's a coming of age book. It's just that the person who's coming of age is already 31 years old. Muir wrote about nine or 10 books. This is a, all of them right here, but I'd start with my first summer in the Sierra. Now, John Muir didn't lay out the John Muir Trail, and he certainly didn't name it after himself. Um, in fact, it wasn't even started until after he had died, and it took several decades to, uh, to make it. But I have a feeling that from day one, they knew who they were going to name it after. Let's go back to backpacking for a second. And believe it or not, we will get to slides in a little, little bit. Um, other than your backpacking gear, the only thing you need to backpack is water, and food. For the food aspect of the John Muir Trail, I, I did a lot of reading and I found that for my body weight and body mass, 
for the first 10 days, or yeah, the first 10 days out, I would need 2,600 calories and 60 grams of protein each day. Uh, that doesn't seem like very much, but of course, the first 10 days, your body's just feeling excess fat anyway. After the first 10 days, then I had to increase the calories to 3,400 calories a day and the protein, excuse me, to 75 grams a day. And after 20 days, it skyrockets to 4,000 calories a day and 90 grams of protein a day. So I worked that out and um, each day I had it apportioned correctly. And I'm pleased to say that in the 26 days that I was on the John Muir Trail, I lost one pound. So I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> now, for backpacking, what you want is food that weighs very little and that you can just add water to. So, hot water, boiling water. So, breakfast consisted of two packs of uh, um, oatmeal, peaches and cream. I added some uh, powdered whole milk, you need whole milk for calories, and it tasted delicious. And then I would also have coffee and Starbucks fortunately makes little via packets. I don't know if you've seen that. Tiny little packets, they weigh nothing. Instant coffee, tastes good. You add some Swiss mixed chocolate and you have mocha. <laughs> now supper, supper was usually uh, freeze dry, weighs nothing. Uh, I would get two servings, but even that was only 400 calories. You add boiling water to it. And, and stir it up, set it aside for 10 minutes, and it cooks. And then you eat. Well, I also added olive oil because I needed the calories. 400 calories isn't much. And then you just eat out of the bag. No dishes to do. Uh, fold this up, put it in your trash bag that you carry out with you. How about lunch? I didn't eat lunch. Uh, Michael and Dave and I always ate lunch. But it became a big thing. We stopped for two hours. We ate so much that we'd get tired. We'd often nap. But uh, on the John Muir Trail, what I did was I would eat every hour because the snacks provided most of my calories. I wasn't trying to eat healthy. I was just wanting calories. So about every hour, I would stop. I would get some water. And then I would start eating snacks. And the snacks might be um, gorp which is granola and raisins and peanuts and M&Ms. Um, one of my favorite snacks was Fritos. Fritos has 160 calories per ounce. Lots of calories, very little weight. It tastes good. I'd eat the calories, I'd eat the Fritos. Peanut butter, yeah, just squirt it out. <laughs> Eat it, <laughs> darn good. Every hour, I got to do this. I never got hungry, but it was, oh, now I can't talk. <laughs> Water. Fortunately, boy. There's <laughs> <Water>. <laughs> Fortunately, in the Sierras, there's a stream every hour or so. So what I would do, I'd walk along and I'd come to a stream and I'd pull out my water bag. My water bag has the filter right in it. You have to filter out Giardia and everything else. So I just scoop up a quart of water, pop the, pop the lid and wow. guzzle down a quart of water, eat my snacks, and maybe put, oh, a third of this full of water uh, to be on the way. Why not more? Water weighs a lot. A quart of water weighs two pounds. I didn't want to carry two pounds of water when I knew that within an hour, I was going to be at another stream. I could just guzzle it down. <coughs> Resupply. You can't carry 26 days of food in your backpack. So you plan to go about four or five days and then resupply. On the John Muir Trail, there were several places to resupply. And I should take a timeout for a second. One thing that makes the John Muir Trail so spectacular is 
that there's only one road in the 212 miles that crosses it. And that's clear up at the top at Yosemite at Tuolumne Meadows. There's a little road that crosses it. Well, it's a highway that crosses it. But otherwise, for the rest of the whole length of time, there's not a dirt road. There's not a logging road. There's nothing. There's no civilization. But there are a few places that you get close to. Red's Meadow is about a half a mile off the trail. I could resupply there. Um, going down a ways, Vermilion Valley Resort. It, it, you have to take a ferry from, from the John Muir Trail to get there, but you can resupply there. Muir Trail Ranch, it's about a mile off. You can resupply there. How do you resupply? Well, you go to Easter's and you get a bucket. And like I said, you've already figured out how many calories you're going to need per day. And you kind of know how many days it's going to be from one resupply to the next. And so you put that food, seal it shut, go to the post office, give them $35 or so per bucket and, and mail it off. And the resupply people for another $20 or so will keep your bucket around until you show up. Of course, you write on it when you expect to be there, uh, but that's how you resupply. So I send it to Red's Meadow. I send it to Muir Trail Ranch um, and I also at Tuolumne Meadows. Now, these places I've mentioned are the first half of the John Muir Trail, but the last 100 miles, there aren't any. And that's where my son came in handy. He was 43 at the time and strong. And so he agreed to uh, hike with me for a week and he would bring a, a lot of food with him uh, and we would meet on the John Muir Trail. And so we hiked uh, for a week and then we exited uh, temporarily for me at Independence, where I resupplied and drew, flew back to Chicago, and then I finished the John Muir Trail. Lightweight backpacking. Um, do you remember in Wild when Cheryl Strat Strayed first picked up her backpack? She couldn't. It didn't budge. It weighed 72 pounds. <laughs> She had everything known to man there. She had books uh, galore there. She had Faulkner's As I Lay Dying. <laughs> she had Flannery O'Connor's short stories. She said it was the one with the peacock on the front. She had lots of other books. She had lots of other things. Well, when I first started backpacking and even for 20 years or so, that's kind of how I was. My backpack weighed 36 pounds. And I think most people who backpack weigh about, their packs weigh about 36 pounds. Like Cheryl Strait, I had lots of, lots of things too, lots of books. First, first year, my novel was John Cheever's The Wapshot Chronicle. I always carried a New Testament. I carried books on trees, on wildflowers. I carried, carried repair manuals. If my, if my uh, water filter stops working and it was an old water filter back then, I've got to be able to repair it. Same thing with the stove. If the stove stops, I've got to be able to repair it. I was carrying all these things, 36 pounds. But a few years ago, I realized that if I was going to keep backpacking into my 70s, I needed to do something lighter. And fortunately, right about that time, they were getting into lightweight backpacking. So I bought the book and it's a great book. <laughs> now, part of lightweight backpacking is just the equipment itself. For years, my backpack was a six pound thing. It could carry anything. Now my backpack is a two pound thing. It can't carry everything, but I'm not taking uh, everything. Uh, my old mattress. It was one. Whoops, where'd it go? It was wonderful. Here it is. Weighed three pounds. You you roll it out. It inflates itself. Very comfortable. Covers all of me. But my new mattress is this. <laughs> you have to blow this up. It only protects down to about here, but that's all I really need. I don't, my legs don't need 
a mattress, so why carry that extra weight? This weighs less than a pound. In fact, it only weighs a half a pound. Um, last week, I was canoe camping up in Michigan, so I took this. It's very comfortable, but the canoe is carrying the weight. But when I'm carrying the weight, I want the little, the little one. My sleeping bag. I had a wonderful sleeping bag for years and years and years. Weighs almost four pounds. Doesn't matter how cold it gets, this keeps me warm. I can be almost naked in this and I stay toasty warm. Now, my sleeping bag weighs barely more than a pound. So that's part of lightweight backpacking. Oh, our old three person tent. Michael and Dave and I took this nine pound behemoth. We could all sleep in it. So we divided it three ways, three pounds a piece, not bad. But now on the John Muir Trail, I had this one and a half pound single tent. So much, much easier to use. I weighed everything. Nancy Brown loaned me her kitchen scales. If you want to know how much chapstick weighs, four tenths of an ounce, I can tell you. Everything that I carried, I weighed. And my total base weight, that's the weight of the pack with everything except food, was 17 pounds. So I had cut my weight in half. Now, food weighs about a pound and a half a day. So if I were out for four or five days and just starting, I had maybe another six pounds of, of food. So I was up to 23 pounds. But then it would start falling right away. Water, I mentioned already, two pounds right here. I carry the little bee free. But I'd seen lots of people with two of these on the John Muir Trail, or worse, they were carrying these big, long 30 ounce things, two of them, almost eight pounds of water. And yet within an hour, they were gonna come to a stream. So, so one of the great things about about lightweight backpacking is it makes you think, why am I carrying this? Why do I need to carry it? <coughs> now, did I carry books? Oh yeah, I carried lots of books. I carried a John Muir book. I carried the whole Bible. I carried all of the poems of Walt Whitman. I carried a, a book about the John Muir Trail. So every night I could read about what was coming up. All of those things, but I carried them on my iPhone, <laughs> iPhones have made backpacking easy. Cheryl Strayed carried a big Minolta camera. I carried a camera, it was my iPhone. Now, how did I charge my iPhone? First of all, I should say, you couldn't call on this. You couldn't receive a newspaper or anything uh, because there was no cell coverage out there, but you don't need that to read a book, but you have to charge it. So I had my little solar panel. And during the day I had the panel hooked up to a battery brick, gradually charging the brick. And then at night while I was sleeping, it would be plugged into the phone, recharging the phone, and also recharging a little emergency device you'll see that I, I carry. <clears throat> Part of lightweight backpacking is philosophical. And this is the last till we get to the slides, but I wanna stress this. Um, we carry too much. Um, Lightweight backpacking would say, don't carry something just because you might need it. For instance, I carried a change of clothes when I was with Michael and, Al and, Michael and uh, Dave, I would carry a change of clothes for every day as if they cared out in the middle of nowhere that I change clothes every day. And what about if it got really cold? It might. So I carried a lot of extra warmth stuff. And uh, lightweight back backpacking would say, Okay, if it gets unbelievably cold one night, you lie awake and you shiver. But don't carry all this extra weight day after day after day because it might get cold. And it will get cold sometimes, but you shiver. We always carried an extra day of food. What happens if we get delayed by weather and we have to stay out an extra day? In 20 years, we never had to stay out an extra day, but every year we carried that extra food. Lightweight backpacking would say, okay, if you have to stay out an extra day, you're hungry that day, but no big deal, don't carry it every day. 
Another tenet of lightweight backpacking that I think you'll understand quite well is when you go to bed at night, if you're not wearing everything you carried with you, then you carried too much. So I had one outfit, one long sleeve shirt, one pair of pants. That's all I had. Now I did cheat and the lightweight backpacking would say, this is all right to cheat. I cheated by carrying an extra pair of underpants and an extra pair of socks. So at night, when I get to my location, I take off my dirty underpants and dirty socks. I put them in a bag of water, add three drops of uh, chlorine bleach. I'm sure Cheryl is saying, oh, that's great. <laughs> Stir it up a little, let it sit for 10 minutes, rinse it out, smelled perfect, was clean. The next day as I'm hiking, it dried. And by that night, that was my latest clean pair. So I took only one pair of clothes. I'd sleep in my clothes. It gets cold there, so you do have to have a down jacket. So I carried this. And at night, I put this on over my shirt. And then you might say, well, how about long underwear? I came to hate long underwear, not because I had, not at the time of the John Muir Trail, long before then. Because you think about it, you put on long, long underwear because you're cold. But you have to first get naked and you get even colder and then you pull on the long underwear and you're hoping to warm up. So I took down pants. I didn't have to take off anything. I just slipped them on over my pants. And these are lighter, believe it or not, than the, uh, in the underwear. And then my feet get cold. So I crawl into bed with my booties on. <laughs> so if I'm wearing all that to bed, that's why my sleeping bag was very light. But it wasn't really a sleeping bag after all. It's a quilt. You see, it's, it's open here. So you might ask, why a quilt? I don't understand that. Well, if you're in a down sleeping bag, you're compressing down under you, and that down doesn't insulate anymore. So if it's not going to insulate, why did you carry it in the first place? So you just have this quilt, and down is against my, or this part of down, not down in, the, in this, is against my mattress. And so I'm not carrying anything like that. Plus, it's very light because I'm wearing everything I carried to bed with me. Now, there were a couple nights when I did get a little chilly, and so I did put on my rain gear, and that was sufficient. One last thing about lightweight I should mention, and didn't before. I didn't have rain pants. I had a rain skirt. Weighs nothing. <laughs> I used to carry... These uh, rain pants are great. I did carry them on the canoe trip last week, but they weigh a lot. The, the little skirt weighs nothing, and then my jacket. You have to carry rain gear. Rain gear is not an option because as you can, even though it hardly ever rains in the Sierra or anywhere else, as you can imagine, if you get wet and it's 37 degrees or 40 degrees or 45 degrees and it's windy, you're not going to last very long. Hypothermia will, will get you. Let's move on to the pictures. And these will take about a half an hour or so, maybe less. And Andrew, could you dim some of the lights? So this is the John Muir Trail. This is Yosemite up here, Tuolumne Meadows. You can see the one little road that goes through. Otherwise, there's not a single road all the way down to the top of Mount Whitney. Now, Red's Meadow, I mentioned that I could resupply there. And of course, at Tuolumne Meadows. 
Also, Vermilion Valley Resort. I could have resupplied there, but I didn't because I knew I was going to resupply at Muir Trail Ranch. But then the rest of it, no place to resupply. So my son, Andrew, hiked in. He didn't want to hike on a normal trail to get in. He hiked over the Lamarck Call. Um, so he started from Bishop. He hiked up and over here, met the John Muir Trail here, and then he and I were supposed to meet somewhere along here. <laughs> <laughs> this is in uh, near the start. Uh, this is in Yosemite. Whoops, 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 <laughs> whoops. <laughs> I'll learn this. Oh, uh, Bernal Falls is only uh, eight tenths of a mile, top of Nevada Falls so far, Glacier Point, Mount Whitney by the John Muir Trail, 211 miles from there. So uh, that's a sign I kind of like. Here's what I looked like when I was out backpacking. This back, this was taken there. You can see my bee free water filter here, my, uh, mattress right there. My dark glasses are here. On the other side is my tent. This just shows you uh, my campsite. Um, I was going to show you my stove and I forgot, but here's the stove. It's just a little, little teeny stove here. I will show it to you. I realize it's kind of dark, but oh, my stove is right here. And you just open it up. In my little water can, I have the fuel. Just screw this on, and it's just as you see there. So I boil water, and then I'd, uh, or I really wouldn't boil it, I'd get it hot and then put it into the into this little fancy cup right there and have my oatmeal. Fancy cup, flat, it opens up. I never did dishes the whole time I was there. Remember, <laughs> uh, Julie says, of course he didn't do just that. <laughs> he needed a woman to do the dishes. So. Uh, but, <laughs> but at night I ate out of this. There was no cleanup there. Uh, breakfast, of course, came out of this. But golly, you swish some water around and drink it afterwards, and that's pretty darn clean. So <laughs> okay. Oh, I do want to point out the bear canister. Pretty soon we'll go through these pictures faster, but the bear canister. That's what all my food had to be in. And at night, you may have heard of people having to put the food up in a tree, but none of us are very good at uh, putting it up in the tree to keep the bears and other animals from getting to it. So for 20 years or more in Yosemite and throughout the Sierra Nevada, if you're backpacking, you're required to have a bear canister. Your food goes in that. You don't have to put it anywhere. You could leave it in camp for that matter because no bear is gonna get into that. Now, this is one government regulation that has been quite effective. The bears, you remember when you were young, we'd see pictures of, of bears always coming up to campers or people in the national parks to get food. And the bears uh, learned that people have food. Well, all of the bears now have grown up with bear canisters. They don't even think of people as having food because they never get any food. And of course, a bear that was getting too close to the public had to be destroyed. Now bears are, are uh, able to live. They don't care about humans. They've never gotten food from humans. So bear, can bear, bear, bear canister is very beneficial. And here you can see I'm charging my my battery brick, I've got my clean underwear out drying, I've got my socks drying. This is one of my many stops when I'm getting some water, eating some snacks, and doing other things at the same time. Okay, now I want to show you what the trail was like. And of course, in 212 miles, it varied all the time. Sometimes it was sandy like this, easy to walk on, as you can see here. And hopefully you'll pay attention to the scenery throughout all of this. Sometimes it was quite 
quite firm and granite, sometimes very firm and lots of granite. Uh, I want you to just pause for a minute and, and realize uh, as I would hike along, I might in an hour meet three or four people in a group coming up from the south. People who are hiking to the south like I was, they walked at about the same pace. And so I didn't get passed often. So I'm in this wonderful area hiking on this little trail here and there's nobody else around. It's just uh, for an introvert, it's just perfect to be out there. <laughs> You can see uh, just beautiful scenery, often hiking along rivers uh, and falls, often crossing rivers. We crossed on rocks and more rocks, sometimes crossed on poles, sometimes dangerous crossing, sometimes so dangerous they put in a bridge. So one time, only one time, Evolution Creek, you have to wade in it. Now, this was one of the first sightings of the person I termed the lady in pink. And we were both headed south. We didn't hike together, but invariably, every day when you least expected it, the lady in pink would show up. It might be crossing a creek. It might be climbing up a steep hill with lots of switchbacks. Often it was at a pass where you've come up high and you're resting before you go down. There's, there's the lady in pink. We kept running into each other so often we finally had our picture taken together and I learned that her name was Tira. She was from Minneapolis. She'd been working in San Francisco, but of course she couldn't afford to stay there. So she lived about an hour out and she was getting tired of the commute. She was going back to Minneapolis, but first she wanted to hike the John Muir Trail. And so day after day, we kept running into her. When my son joined me, I told her, I told him, we don't know when it'll happen, but every day we'll run into the lady and think. <laughs> this is my tent. We're gonna show a few pictures of, of my tent, weighed just over a pound, uh, just big enough for one person. I should mention one nice thing about the tent, the reason it was so light was it didn't have any tent poles. You just use your trekking poles. And so you'll see the trekking pole is holding it up here and the trekking pole is holding it up there. <clears throat> Since you're gonna have trekking poles anyway, it might as well substitute for tent poles. Now, this night it was still early in the hike. It was Thousand Island Lake. A lot of people just come to Thousand Island Lake because they can hike in in a day or two. They're not on the John Muir Trail. But this was one of the biggest tents I'd ever seen. And uh, it happened to be near mine. And it got to be close to bedtime. And the lady who was in here decided that tent wasn't big enough. She needed to put on her pajamas. She got out of her tent, took everything off, put on her pajamas. Like I said, it was early in the trail. I thought, boy, this John Muir trail is gonna be great. <laughs> but that was the only incident. <laughs> Here's my tent. On this particular day, it was very windy. I couldn't get my tent up um, because there aren't poles that hold it up. It's, I've got to do it myself. So I finally hid behind uh, this brush and was able to get it up that way. You'll notice the bear vault. The one great, another great thing about the bear vault, I could sit on it. You know, there, occasionally there's a, a log you can sit on, but uh, you, most of the time there's not because you're not camping in a campground. You're camping anywhere you want to. And, and so the bear vault helps. You'll notice that this tent is on a very sandy area. It's not over here. You can't put your tent on vegetation. You can put it anywhere as long as it's dead, sandy stuff. So this area, I walked by it one evening, I kept thinking, oh, there's got to be a better spot. And after 10 minutes, I came back to this and said, no, that will do. And so I put up my tent right there. Now a few slides just showing scenery. Um, 212 miles of spectacular scenery. It's always like 
this. And again, nobody else there, just me. Logs clear under the water, but very visible. Um, I mentioned that almost halfway down was Vermilion Valley Resort, and you could take a ferry there. I wasn't resupplying at Vermilion Valley, but I'd heard so much neat stuff about it. And I heard that on Saturday nights they did barbecue, and this was Saturday. So I decided I'd wait at the ferry and take the ferry from the John Muir Trail to VBR. And when I sat down, this guy sat down, and he was not hiking on the trail. He was hiking cross country all over the Sierras, but he had come down because he wanted to go to VBR. He was resupplying there. He got to talking and he mentioned that he had just published a book on the John Muir Trail. Well, I just bought a book on the John Muir Trail. I asked him, does it have a pretty cover with El Capitan on the front? And he said, yeah, it does. <laughs> and so this was Damon Corsco, Corso. So it was neat to meet Damon. He was thrilled to think that anyone had bought a book, let alone <laughs> somebody he met had bought his book. <laughs> so, so we're getting on the, uh, on the ferry here, headed down Lake Thomas Edison for three or four miles to Vermilion Valley Resort. It was a nice food, nice barbecue that night, huge breakfast the next day. I could have slept in the campground. I put, could have pitched my tent again, but instead I paid $10 and said, I think I'll sleep up in here on one of the cots. And only one other person was in there, so I kind of spread out. Um, the next, well, two days later of hiking, I was down to Muir Trail Ranch. And Muir Trail Ranch is a place where I resupplied. I had sent a Easter's bucket there. But months in advance, I had decided this is halfway or almost halfway. I bet my body needs some rest. So I reserved two nights in a cabin. And it was kind of wonderful. My body didn't need any rest, but it was sure nice to be there. This was my cabin right here, number eight. Here's the inside. And here's my Easter's resupply bucket. Um, I, I, I was thinking about maybe not shaving, but I had sent along a big razor in my resupply. I took a picture to see what I looked like. I decided I better shave. <laughs> <laughs> the next day, I had the whole day off. It was kind of nice. I was able to do laundry. Here's the washing machine. You, you put your laundry in there. You put some Tide in, and then you start cranking it over and over and over and over, and it cleans it, and then you rinse it here. Uh, dry it here and put it up on the clothesline. So uh, that day I had really nice clean clothes. Good meals in this uh, dining room. Here are some of the people. So after two nights there, I headed out and I was supposed to meet Andrew at McClure Meadows. Uh, McClure Meadows is a ranger station. We're down to Kings Canyon National Park now. And Kings Canyon uh, pays temporary workers to spend the summer out in cabins like this along the John Muir Trail, which at this point is also the Pacific Crest Trail. So they help rescue people. Uh, they have to be helicoptered in. I suppose they could walk forever to get there, but they're helicoptered in. They stay at places like this. So I was supposed to meet Andrew there. This is why it was called McClure Meadow. It's a nice, beautiful meadow. It's famous for its sunsets. And here you can see some of the other hikers out enjoying the sunset. Wow. But I didn't get to enjoy any of that because when I got to McClure Meadows at four o'clock, I half expected my 40 year old son to be there, but he wasn't. Uh, so I sat here most of the time. Kept waiting for Andrew to show up, waiting for Andrew to show up. I did uh, take a minute to go and make this photograph. Then I was quickly back there. Finally, I ran to my own campsite, got my supper stuff, brought it back here. Kept and cooked and ate there. Kept worrying about Andrew. It got to be dark. And some of the other campers would mosey by and they'd ask me, has your son shown up yet? <laughs> no, no, he hasn't. 
we had a plan. We knew this might happen. So we had a plan that if he couldn't make it, then he'd camp wherever he was. And the next morning he'd keep coming north and I'd be coming south and we'd meet. And if he had broken his leg or something and we didn't meet, then I would use my little emergency device and I could send a brief text message to Mary and she would call the authorities and make sure that they were looking for Andrew. At any rate, it's nice to have a plan, but when it gets dark and it gets cold and you're trying to sleep in your bag and you're worried about your 43 year old son, uh, I didn't sleep much that night. It, it was very cold. I kept thinking, what if he, he's coming over this thing? It's not a trail. Nobody else is there. It's the Lamarck call. Now, Damon Corso, the guy I met, he said, oh yeah, I've been over the Lamarck call. It, it's not that bad. But I pictured him maybe spraining his ankle, maybe breaking his ankle. It's cold. How is he? But our plan worked. The very next day, I started hiking in 40 minutes. There comes Drew, and we met on the trail. Uh, the rest of that day was beautiful, of course. And, and one key thing about that day was we were going to hike up and over Muir Pass. And up at the top, the Sierra Club has built this hut. It's called Muir Hut. You may have seen it some places. You're not really allowed to sleep there, but if the weather turns bad, uh, you can go into that. So uh, this was the view from up at the top of Muir Pass. Wonderful. And what's that? Wonderful. Yeah. And then we started, started down across the creek, drew in advance. Whoops. And that first night, here's where we camp. My tent, Drew's tent. You can see his has, has camping or uh, tent poles and everything. He's young, he can carry that plus all the extra food he brought to me. <clears throat> Second night out, he put up his tent. This was where my tent was going. He had a funny look on his face and that's because in his hand, he had a flask of scotch. <laughs> a month earlier had been my 71st birthday and he and his wife Tamina gave me a bottle of scotch for my birthday. I didn't know that, but they did. And he had filled a flask with some of the scotch. And so every night, just before going to bed, we'd sit there sharing, passing the flask back and forth and, and chatting. It was, it was nice. Yeah. Yeah. So now just some pictures of, of the scenery of day after day. We hiked for seven days. Here's a pass. And this is not the girl in pink. This is actually a guy, but here's, uh, here's Andrew coming to this pass. We decided to have our picture taken at the pass. I, I've forgotten uh, which one it is. I think it's Pincho Pass. But as we took that picture, I, I remember back to 20 some years earlier in Glacier National Park where Drew backpacked with us, with us for the first time. Dave Williams, myself, Andrew, 20 some, he was a college student at that time in beautiful Glacier Park. Oh, wow. So, Coming down from a pass, you can see it zigzag, zigzag, zigzag. And here are some of the other people at the pass, and the lady in pink was there, and Andrew. <laughs> you pause at passes and spend 20 minutes or so. Uh, you've been hiking for a long time to get there. Again, the spectacular scenery up there. Yes. Drew headed down the pass. One more picture of us. Um, this is a famous bridge. It's a suspension bridge over Woods Creek. You're only supposed to have one person on it at a time, but Drew and I wanted a picture. So we just went out a tiny ways and uh, a nice lady took our picture there. After a week, we'd come to the point, there was an intersection, Kearsarge Lakes, Kearsarge Pass, Onion Valley, leading out to Independence. It was time for uh, us to be saying goodbye. We still had one more day. We had to go, go up and out over Kearsarge Pass. The John Muir Trail was headed south. I'd get back on it eventually. But we went up and over Kearsarge Pass. But as we got up there, suddenly a thunderstorm was coming. And you can see, and the one place you don't want to be in a thunderstorm is Pass. And so we hustled as fast as we could down the other side. And suddenly the lady in pink showed up and she was hustling right behind us. And we set up camp, Drew and I here and, and Tira back over there. And by the next day, we were down to Independence 
In this motel that's uh, famous for resupplying John Muir Trail people, Drew caught the red eye home to Chicago. I spent the night there. And the next morning, they served us a lovely breakfast. And then it was back up over Kearsarge again, much better weather this time, and back to the John Muir Trail. We only had a few days left until Mount Whitney, a few more beautiful campsites, and one more horrendous pass, the worst pass of all, Forester Pass. It take, here's people climbing on Forester Pass. It takes a half a day to climb the 13,200 feet to the top. Well, we didn't start at zero. We started at 11,000 or 10,000, but uh, to get to the top of Forester Pass. And of course, Tiro is there. <laughs> Okay, we've finally gotten to a sign that says Mount Whitney, 16 miles. It did say 211 miles. We're getting near the end. Now it says Mount Whitney, seven and a half miles. This is a bad slide. Last week when I was canoe camping, I kept debating, should I include this slide or not? Mary hates this slide. <laughs> By showing you this slide, I have guaranteed that tonight, Max, my dog, and I will be in the guest bedroom. <laughs> this slide leads to a discussion of the bathroom. 26 days. You might say, does the park service keep little porta potties? No, uh -uh. So we're all adults. If you have to have a bowel movement, you dig a six inch, it has to be at least six inch hole. You go in the hole, cover it up. Toilet paper, we used to burn it. No, you fold it up, put it in a Ziploc, carry it out with you. And believe it or not, there's nothing to it. And you carry it for four or five days and uh, you get to the next resupply place and you toss it in the, in the garbage. There's nothing to it. This is extra special because we're near Mount Whitney and you can't dig a hole near Mount Whitney. There are, it's granite. And so you have, you reach down in this thing. If you're going to Mount Whitney, you reach down, you pull out a wag bag. I think that stands for something, but I think Nassau probably developed it. It's got all kinds of wonderful chemicals. And so if you have to have a bowel movement, you do it in the bag, the chemicals take over, you put it in your backpack, you carry it on with you, and when you get back to civilization, then you throw it away. Well, thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs> Good old Nancy. <laughs> I was gonna say tonight, as you're crawling into bed with your spouse, just realize that Max and I are crawling into the guest bed. <laughs> So by now, Tira and I decided we'd cross paths so often, we were going to summit together. So we camped together at uh, Guitar Lake. By now, I was carrying Drew's tent because I thought it'd be so windy there that my tent wouldn't go up, but it wasn't that windy. Tira was here. I was here. We got up. We set our alarms for 4.30 the next morning. Got up at eight at that time, and by the time there was a slight bit of light, we were on our way, climbing up and up and up, and it was beautiful. Up and up and up, and I always like seeing a sign because that means I've come to an intersection, and sure enough, and I have to explain this, the John Muir Trail is coming up here, and there's an intersection, and then you can go on up to the top of Mount Whitney, two more miles. But people can also be coming up from Lone Pine, way over here to the east. And those people can have a two-day pass. You have to have a pass, so they, they restrict how many people. So they're coming up from there. And of course, once we've been to the top, we're not going to go clear back up to Yosemite that way. We're going to exit this way also. So you can see a couple backpacks. Well, it's an intersection. There were lots of backpacks. Almost all of these were people coming up from Lone Pine, whereas Tira and I had come up from the John Muir Trail. Whoops. Mount Whitney, two miles. And so we started out 
the final two miles. Our trail is right along there. It looks dangerous. It wasn't dangerous. Oh. Well, I mean, yeah. it could be, but it really wasn't. <laughs> Here's the trail. Here's somebody. Yeah. Um, there were places where you had to get down on your hands and knees to get over it. Not we looked down, and that's where we camped, and you can see why it was called Guitar Lake. That's where we had started early that morning. And believe it or not, there are people here climbing across. I think they're right there. You'll, I'm magnifying it, and you can see them right in here. There were indeed people. Finally, we're, we've reached the, the building. We know we're near the top. It's only a few more feet. I'm ecstatic. Tira's even more ecstatic. <laughs> we posed for a photograph. And we felt like we were in the top of the world. Mount Whitney is the highest point in the continental United States. Mount McKinley, of course, in Alaska is taller, but this is the highest point. <clears throat> I mentioned that Dave, Dave Williams in 1990 had taken us to the top of Mount Rainier. It's almost 14,500, just a few, few feet short. But... Hmm. And people were staying there for half an hour, 45 minutes. They'd had a tough two days just getting up. They were celebrating. Did you have a problem with altitude? To... Um, good question. Altitude. I'm going to take a diversion for a second. Um, my first hike backpacking in 1988, I knew about altitude sickness. But I, I didn't know if I could get it or not. We went to Rocky Mountain National Park. We immediately, I mean, that's a high park. We immediately were camping at 9,000 feet. The second night out, 10,000 feet. And that night I woke up and I had a headache and I didn't think much about it. The next morning, I went to pump water. And my job among the three was I was the water pumper. I would take... This gizmo, and I would pump water. But I was so weak, I couldn't pump. And I realized something is desperately wrong. And then I couldn't stand up, and I just laid on a rock. And my good friend Michael uh, obliged by taking a picture of me looking dead <laughs> on a rock. And Michael and, and uh, uh, Dave packed all my stuff together between the two of them when we started down and within a thousand feet I was suddenly back to normal. So yes, I get altitude sickness. So how did I get to 13,000? How did I get to 14,5? Well, I went out three days earlier and 8,000 feet is the key thing. My high school classmate Bob Mazawa met me in San Francisco and we drove to Mammoth Lakes, 8,000 feet. Uh, Mammoth Lakes on the east side of uh, of uh, Yosemite, and we spent, he spent three days with me at 8,000 feet. We do day hikes every day, higher, but it's, the key thing is where do you sleep? You sleep below 8,000 or above, but after 8,000, I was acclimating, and so my first few days, gradually, when I was out, 9,000, 10,000, by then I was acclimated. Now, there's drugs, acetazolamide, I did take acetazolamide, and it works, and it's, Works pretty well, but I didn't want pretty well. So that's why I went out early and, and acclimated. Um, thank you. Yeah, good question, Nancy. Thank you. Um, this was the one place in the whole trip where I had cell coverage. It was Sunday morning. It was 10 o'clock. That meant it was noon here. Mary had just gotten back from church, and she was with my mother uh, um, uh, eating dinner. And so I... I called there and I got to talk to my mom and talk to Mary from the top of Mount Whitney. And it was really, wow, really special. Yes. Now, um, Tira and I headed down, it was a long way down to Lone Pine. We camped there. And then I had arranged months in advance, I had arranged a, a um, shuttle service to drive me back to Yosemite, the floor of Yosemite Valley. And I could sleep there, and the next day I would take a series of buses and a train back to San Francisco, and my friend Bob Mazawa, and he'd put me up and then get me to the airport. So I'm sitting there on the floor of Yosemite Valley, and I'm thinking, okay, 
I have to be in public on the bus and the train. I've got to smell halfway decent, but I only have one pair of clothes. So, so I went to the laundromat at Yosemite Valley. But then the question arises, what do I wear while I'm at the laundromat? <laughs> well, there was only two things that weren't being washed, my rain jacket and my rain skirt. So I'm sitting there, I'm trying to look in, in, inconsequential or whatever, and against the wall reading a book and people come and go and they see me, but they don't really see me. And finally, I remember, oh, my friend Don Fisher once said, I wanna see a picture of you in this rain outfit. So I meekly went over to a guy and said, would you take my picture? And he's saying, oh, that's stupid. But yeah, I'll do it. And suddenly his eyes were open. <laughs> and he starts giggling and said, oh yeah, we need, we need a picture. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well done, you. Well, thank you. <laughs> Since we're sitting here in the library and we're a bit of a literary society, I want to uh, close with a poem. It was a poem that every day, um, probably every mile, it was on my mind, it was on my heart, it was on my lips. It's a poem by E.E. E. Cummings. I thank you, God, for most this amazing day, for the leaping greenly spirits of trees and a blue true dream of sky, and for everything that is natural, that is infinite, that is yes. I who have died am alive again today, and this is the sun's birthday. This is the birthday of life and of love and wings and of a gay great happening illimitably earth. How should tasting, touching, searing, seeing, hearing, breathing, any lifted from the know of all nothing, human merely being, doubt unimaginable you? Now the ears of my ears awake, and now the eyes of my eyes are open. I thank you, God, for most this amazing day. I, I hope from seeing all the pictures you can imagine, yeah, if I were out there, that psalm would be in my heart and in my, on my lips also. One of you has already asked and said, sometime in the future, I want to get together with you and talk about backpacking and talk about the John Muir Trail and learn what I can. If anyone else wants to do that, just let me know, and I'm sure we can arrange a time, and maybe we can all be together, or we'll do it separately, but just let me know. Um, we can take some a few minutes of questions, and then uh, as you're leaving, feel free to come up and pick up this or pick up this. Or, uh, the water filter, this is what I used to carry. Now, now this little teeny device is the water filter, and it's proven to be effective. So feel free to do that. Any yeah questions? You mentioned one that you have an emergency device is that like a transponder and so i meant to show that it's a little device that was hanging here and um it's called in reach there are various things um you can if you're totally incapacitated you could press that it goes by satellite and and then um the forest service or the national park or rescue people would come and and find you because that is um that tells them exactly where you are now, this device, I was able to actually send brief little text messages, and I would send that to Mary, and then she would email our friends and, and let them know. But yeah. And secondly, you mentioned the bear vault. Uh -huh. You're not carrying that with you, are you? Yeah. <laughs> That's why we hate it. Every ounce is or something. You know, where are you carrying it? Are you packing other stuff in it? Or what? Uh, as, as the food goes down, I pack. But, you know, I didn't carry very much. But... In this whole backpack, most of my stuff was on the outside. The bear vault took up much of it. Oh. So at the start of a four days or five days, that bear vault was almost full of stuff. And then uh, it would get less and less, but I didn't really have anything to put in there. I didn't have clothes to put in there. I didn't have anything to put in there. 
Um, but that's also, and I should have shown, I should have shown you uh, Drew's bear ball. It was much bigger than mine. Uh, and in the, but he's much younger than I am. And he carried an awful lot of food uh, to help get us through that time. So, yeah. What type of wildlife did you see? You know, not a lot. There are black bears there. You don't have to fear black bears. Uh, I doubt, well, maybe a black bear has killed somebody in history, but not, not often. Um, now, grizzly bears in uh, Glacier, that would be a different story. They have killed. They don't intend to, but if you get between them and their cubs, they do. Um, otherwise, there was a lot of uh, wildlife that I didn't know. Lots of birds and uh, certain squirrels and things like that, but uh, I didn't see snakes or um, I did see marmots. They were kind of fun. What time of year did you do this and what temperature fluctuations did you have? Uh, I did it August 19th until about September 12th or so. I didn't have a choice, although I think that was the ideal time. You have to apply for permits and they only allow about 40 people a day to start down the John Muir Trail. And this was my second year of trying. So you send in an application, the application is good for three weeks. Every day they draw, do a, do their drawing. The first 45 get a good answer. Uh, the others don't. So you, it comes by email. And day after day after day after day, the email would say fa uh, failed or something like that. This went on for two years. And, uh, and you can only really hike the John Muir Trail from about early July till about <clears throat> late September or so. Before early July, there's still so much snow. It's, you'd have to do snow hiking. Um, by October, it's starting to snow and the passes will be filling up. So I was just lucky to get that particular uh, time. Uh, I could have spent as many days as I wanted. I, a few people have done it in two weeks. Uh, I was in no rush. It took me 26 days. So. Uh, the weather, it was decent at night. There were a couple nights it got down below freezing. Um, during the day, it was in the 60s. It was almost always sunny. The Sierras is almost always sunny. I never got wet. Uh, we had that thunderstorm coming through. There were a few little sprinkles, but we lucked out. But if, if I'd have gotten wet, that's fine. That's what the tent's for. That's what the rain gear's for. By the next day, I would dry out. So, yeah. yeah, Nancy. I'm curious about the water filter thing. Uh-huh. Does that filter all the water that you need for the whole 46 days? Yeah. Uh, thank you. It's designed that uh, as it starts to get, I mean, the water, first of all, is very, very, very clean. You can see right through it. What you're wanting is the uh, giardia cysts and some bacteria and stuff. But if this starts to get uh, uh, clogged up, you just put it down and swish it like that in the water and it improves. Now, by the end of the trip, yeah, I wouldn't want to use it any longer. It was getting slower and slower. Yeah, Ken? How, how do you know on this that you're on the right? Right. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I took maps and there are other people, well, it's, you know, there, there aren't signs except at intersections, but it's a well-worn trail. Then I also had one other app on this. It was called Gut Hooks. I don't know why, but Gut Hooks used the GPS system. Again, didn't have cell coverage, but it and, and I could click on that and it would show me exactly where the John Muir Trail was and it would show me exactly where I was. There was only one time I had, well, a couple of times I used it, only one time did it say, yeah, you're off the trail. And believe it or not, it was near Red's Meadow. And I totally missed Red's Meadow and I didn't know where I was. And I looked on gut hooks and it said, mm, you're not on the trail. But otherwise I used it just to confirm what I thought. I, but, uh, but I didn't want to depend on that. I wanted to depend on my map and, and this type of thing. Can I take that question a little bit farther? 
So uh, the, all the granite and everything is like, how did you know where to walk through? That was the part that I could see. The rest of it was pretty well marked. But <laughs> yeah, that it was still clear. Okay. There are a lot of places that that Dave and Michael and I have hiked where, where you weren't really, really sure. And then they put up Karen's. Karen's is at least three rocks on top of each other. If you have two rocks, that might be an accident, but if you have three or four. And so if it's an area of granite where you could get lost, people would have put a Karen here and then a little farther along a Karen there. But on the, I don't remember needing that on the John Muir Trail. Yeah, Paul. <clears throat> You mentioned Michigan. Um, where in Michigan did you have it? Uh, it was the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. I was with Dan Varland. Some of you remember Dan Varland. And so that's quite an experience, of course, to be with Dan. And, and uh, so uh, up there on Upper Peninsula, it was called the Sylvania Wilderness. And we were canoeing on lakes up there. This Bob that you mentioned, what was his last name? Uh, Bob, Bob. Mazawa. Bob Mazawa. Bob Mazawa, of course. You don't remember. He came when we that's were juniors. Why, that's why. Yeah. <laughs> he was on this? He was in San Francisco. He didn't go on the trail with me, but I knew I needed to get from San Francisco to Mammoth Lakes in order to acclimate. And I thought, I'll call Bob and... Um, Hopefully he'll be willing to take me over there. And he was. And so he met me at the airport. We drove clear to Mammoth Lakes. He spent three days with me. And then at the end, he- Did you take driver's ed? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably. <laughs> you don't remember the driver's ed. No. I do. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'll let him know that you remember. <laughs> you tell him I- Thoroughly hope that he got better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. More questions? What's that? What brand of hiking shoes? Oh. I can't tell you. I change them as as Mary will tell you. I change them every few years, but they don't throw them away. They're special. But uh, oh, they. I think they were vast hiking boots. Um, they were nice and light. I used to, I was going to bring, I used to bring or wear big waffle stompers. They weighed three to four pounds, but you needed that when you're carrying 36 pounds of weight. But when you're down to 17 pounds, the hiking boots are almost sneakers. So why carry two pounds on each foot when you can carry just ounces on each foot as you're walking? Yeah. Well, this how many hours did you walk a day? Um, I figured it out. Yeah, so I walked about nine hours a day. I usually walk 10 miles, 11 miles, 12 miles a day. Um, and it was fun. Um, when Michael and Dave and I camped together, it was the evenings that was the most fun. We would hike for three or four hours, and then we'd get to a campsite. We'd sit around and talk and read and everything else. But when I started hiking by myself, I found that the evenings, um, I got kind of lonely being there by myself. Um, and on the John Muir Trail, uh, when I get to civilization like Red's Meadow or Vermilion Valley Resort, I'd get a little bit irritable. And I wasn't pleasant to be around. And, and I, the first time was at Red's Meadow and I thought, oh golly, I still got weeks to go and I'm not enjoying this. But the minute the pack was on my back and I was hiking, oh, everything was wonderful. And so hiking for nine or 10 hours in a day was, was quite pleasurable. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah. Everything that you did, you smiling big. Yeah, well, it was it was it was neat to be there. All right. Uh, Have you? Uh, mm -hmm. Do you do any shorter uh, hiking trips, uh, like especially in this area? I, I, I'm new to the area, and I've, I've just discovered the the one by that starts at Blanchard that goes up to uh, Omaha. Yeah, the Wabash Trace. Yeah, uh, I bicycle on that, but yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. 
any backpacking I've done has been at least Colorado or further uh, west. Right. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and almost all of my trips were short. Um, Drew, uh, since Drew joined me four years ago, he got his son to, and uh, he and his son and I uh, hiked for a week on the John Muir Trail this past year. Uh, so yeah, I kept doing some backpacking, but uh, yeah. What are the questions uh, mm -hmm. on the people on Zoom here? If you could hike a section of the trail again, which section would you hike? I, uh, I think the section that Andrew and his sons all and I did last year is a section I'd hike again, which was called North Lake to South Lake. And so if you Google North Lake to South Lake, um, the, the person would find it. Uh, there's also a section called Ray's Lake, and that's a famous area. You need permits for each of those. You have to you have to apply early, maybe six months in advance on, I think, reservation or recreation.gov or whatever. Uh, so either North Lake to South Lake or Ray's Lake. All right. Well, so thank you. Uh, thank you.